Hey everybody, welcome back. We are diving into a really important topic today, something that we see in in our lives every day, especially in the year 2020 right now with the election coming up. But um, we're going to talk about something that is usually oversimplified, but we're really going to look at, uh, at, at kind of the scope of um, political parties in the United States. We'll look at where they come from, how they change over time, what do they do, right, and how do they do it. So we're going to look at a couple different aspects of political parties as we continue our look into elections. So the first thing we have to do when we're, when we're talking about this brand new subject, just like any subject, is define the terms we're talking about. The key term today that we're going to have to know what we're referring to is a political party. A political party um, really is just a group of voters that back and support certain policies. They help certain um, people get elected so that they can get these policies carried out. It's not just Republicans and Democrats. There are many other choices, although in the United States today, these are the two predominant political parties. These things can change over time. There can be different groups. There are more than two political parties, but in the United States, there are only two dominant ones. Um, these are really kind of groups about people band together, and there's different variations inside of these groups, but they have similar political ideologies, so similar ideas about government, about what government should be doing, how society should function, um, and, and they're really, really organized. They're not just a massive blob of people. They have a purpose. They're organized in a very specific way to create specific results to get people they want in power, members of their party, in order to get policies that they like that match their um, political ideologies and philosophies. And, and one of the most important pieces that I think it's um, understated or even just forgotten about is the purpose of why political parties exist. These parties are a link between the governed, so the people, and those who govern. They're a way of getting information, ideas, and values from the people to the actual top levels of government and everywhere in between. So when we looked at that definition of what political parties are, they're really only in that definition more positive functions what they're intended to do however they're not always a good thing and they're not always seen as a good thing even in our country when you go back to where they really start to first appear during the beginning of the eras following the u.s constitution um you're even going to see it in some major writing the federalists wanted to convince the public of the merits and the value of this strong constitution and they take time to look at the different levels of democracy and why um, a government like the one that they're trying to craft and ratify is necessary and in one of them federalist paper number 10 written by james madison he takes an entire paper entire essay to focus on just the dangers of these factions that he calls them the dangers of these political parties warning that they could be violent they could be controlling, but not controlling by a, a small minority like a tyrant, but controlling by the masses um, rather than necessarily the best option for the people. Um, and he really thinks about this and displays it in a very rational way. He looks at what can we control with facts? What can we control with political parties? He says they're a part of life. You, you can't get around for them. Think about what happens in high school. There are groups or cliques that start to form. They do have positive social functions of unity, of sense of purpose, of socialization, but there's a lot more to them. Um, when you're looking at both ends of the spectrum about what you can do about an issue, you can't um, completely eliminate it because it's a natural part of, of human life. So which end can you control? Can you control the source, where they come from? Can you control the effect of them? And where in between can you try to fix this problem? So first we'll look at what he says about the source. Um, the only way to get rid of them is if you completely ban them. But if you ban them, you're removing liberty from society. And you, know really ha you don't really have a democratic republic anymore. Um, so if you try to cut out the source, that's kind of a little bit of an issue. The way that he describes um, them are air is to fire as factions are government right you can't eliminate that you can't control the wind that's feeding these these giant fires um or or his other way of looking at it, if you do actually ban them and strip liberty from society the remedy would be worse than the disease the side effects are worse than the actual issue you have before so controlling the source doesn't work 
let's look at the other end. What about the effect? Can you tamper or, or, or limit the effects? Um, the idea is support one national unified opinion all throughout. Then there's no need for political parties, but that's impossible to get people thinking um, every same, everybody thinking the exact same thing about every single issue. That's not realistic or possible. So we can only hope to, to limit the negative effects from it and try to change them in a different way. Now, it's not possible to completely eradicate these, um, and there's not one um, single state system because um, that doesn't work either, and our country doesn't have that. We have more a what's called a two-party system, but Madison was in favor of something else, which we don't have today. He would not be a fan of the way the political system is set up today. Um, he argued for something instead called a multi-party system, where instead of a single party system, a one political party state where there is only one choice, um, that he wants to have multiple options so that if there is this fear of mob control or fear of mass control, then what we're going to do is we'll be spreading that out and hopefully kind of even out the power that each of these groups way. Um, and really, this would be a way to try to prevent tyranny from the masses and tyranny from a single group. But the problem with that is it also doesn't necessarily create national unity. Now, if the United States had what's called a multi-party system, very similar to like, say, like the English parliament, or maybe what you would see in Germany, um, there are many, many different parties. Um, it's not just two like today where Republican and Democrat, and that's really the controlling system government, you can see um, today in this system um, what it would look like based on the 2016 election results. If you looked at, say, the far left Social Democratic Party, or we'd say socialist led by, say, Bernie Sanders getting 26% of the vote, that would determine how many seats in the legislature that would get. If you go on the far right, you have Donald Trump getting 112 seats the People's Party, a populist party, a heavy, more nationalist party, right, getting roughly around 26% of the vote. That's how many seats that um, people from that party would get in the House of Representatives. Um, the liberal central left party, we have represented by Hillary Clinton here, 28%. They would get a certain chunk, 124 seats of the 435. There would be smaller groups right, like John Kasich and, and Ted Cruz here of the center right and, and not as far right as, say, Donald Trump is, um, and, and they would have their own portion. It would be based on a percentage basis of how many votes you got determines how many seats you would get in the House, and this would create um, a, a general setup of a split of a government. So there is no one giant ruling party. Now, in this case, there's kind of three that have a majority, but there's also a larger on here, the largest amount that anyone would have, a single party would have control over in this house, would be this liberal party represented by Hillary Clinton. 28%, that would be the majority, that 28% of who got the most votes, and so they would have the most control. But the power would be spread out thinner across the board. Now, we do not have this in our country today, and we're going to look at where it is seen in our country as we move forward, and when do they really start to appear in the format that we see them today? So our political parties really start um, to come up in the later 1700s. They don't really exist in the colonization period. Um, the first successful English colony is Jamestown in 1607. Um, all the way up until 1776, we have our revolution, nothing's there. Articles of Confederation, not really there. The constitutional period, you start to see some rumblings of it. Um, our first president, even, once we get into the constitutional era, George Washington is unaffiliated. He doesn't have an official political party. He is the only president in U.S. history to have no official affiliation with the political party, even though his actions leaned a little bit more towards one party than the other. Um, when... Washington leaves. There's not a lot of rules necessarily on the book, but he steps away and he warns in his farewell address, his famous farewell address of a couple things. One, foreign entangling alliances, and number two, domestic issue, political parties, especially those rooted in geography, those east and west and north and south, that it's going to literally divide the country, not just figuratively divide it. Um, and that 
these ideas are, are really important, of course, to, to advocate for. But if we allow these factions to root inside of our country, um, it's going to split us apart. So it's in our best interest to not allow these to form or prevent them from forming or tamper their control. However, it basically ignores the warning, and then we start to see the emergence of our first two political parties immediately following Washington stepping away. And not even before he's dead, you're going to see the emergence of two of um, the first political parties in our country's history. Now, throughout our country's history, there have been many different political parties. However, um, when our political system is most stable and where we see on a larger average how many political parties we have or prominent political parties we have at a time, the answer ends up being two. And it falls down a line between liberalism and conservatism. And this goes all the way back to our first political parties following George Washington's administration all the way still to today. When we're talking about these terms, we are not using the terms Republican and Democrat. Today, we would use those terms. However, when we're looking at the span of history and history of other countries politically, we need to be very specific in what we're talking about. When we use the word conservative, we are talking about limited um, federal government. We are talking about keeping social values as they are, more traditional, um, sometimes more religiously connected not always. And then on the other end, we're going to have and use the term liberals. Um, liberals are looking for progressive social values, so things to change, government-run social aid, um, so government intervention. And that's how, in the United States at least, we divide those terms. Um, and you can usually use those terms and apply those to the world as well when we look at forms of government. But understand, these two examples that I gave you, the first one um, with conservatives, that picture that's Ronald Reagan in the background, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is our problem. Um, president of the 1980s, modern Republican. Then we have the foundation for the modern Democrats, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, democracy alone of all forms of government enlists the full force of men's enlightened will, that it's all about this kind of coming together of social values and, and striving through the Great Depression, government intervention heavily, and that becomes the model for the modern Democratic Party. But that changes given on, uh, on the different decade and the different issue. For example, the election of 1860 is a great example of this. Um, the Southerners are the um, party that wants slavery to continue. They want um, conservatives, the Democrats in the antebellum Civil War period in the 1800s are the heavy, heavy conservatives. The Northerners, they like the Republicans or the abolitionists, are the much more liberal ones in society. So you can't limit it in every single decade based on geography or based on one political party, because even throughout decades and centuries, those roles flipped. The Democrats today are much more the liberals. The Republicans are much more the conservatives in our point of view. And the issue is why do we have this split? But why do we fear of having more than one party or more than two parties in our country's history? Well, we're looking at it a game from electing our officials, getting officials into office. Those officials can enact your given policies for your party. If you have too many people, like you can see here on the right, um, you have four different colors. You have that um, kind of cute green, you have a teal, um, you have a yellow, um, and you have a red, that there's many factions, there's splits. Um, the red is the Republican, the green, the teal, and that orangish yellow are all Democrats. They split their votes and the Republican wins in that case. Or a more famous example, leading up into World War I, the Republicans run a man by the name of Howard Taft. Um, a different political party is formed by a man named Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was president from 1901 until 1908, and then he stepped down. 
half was president from 1908 until 1912. And in the election of 1912, this past Republican president wants to run again. He doesn't like the way that the current Republican president is running things. But they give, the Republicans that is, give the nomination to Taft. And so as a result, Eddie Roosevelt still wants to run, and he forms a brand new party, a progressive party called the Bull Moose Party. It is a party composed of primarily Republicans, a different sect of Republicans, but he runs along with the other Republican Taft, and they split their votes. If you pooled their votes together, their um, electoral college votes and their popular votes. Um, their popular votes would have changed the scope of the effects of all the other states across the country. They would have likely, the Republicans would have likely won the presidency in 1912. However, as a result, because the Republicans are so fractured and split, because they're competing with each other and the Democrats, the Democrats will most likely take the White House for the next two terms. So this is an example about why Americans are fearful of having that split. It's trying to enact your policies, and we group ourselves in larger groups because there are that kind of cliche, the strength in numbers, but it allows you to be hyper-organized, gives you more resources, and more importantly, in a representative democracy, it gets you more votes. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at our first two political parties in our country's history to really get an idea of what the two-party system looks like. Now, our first two political parties emerge um, originally from the um, Constitutional Convention, and those groups sort of split off from that. Uh, maybe you remember the Feds and the Anti-Feds. But um, what we're really going to be looking at first is these central issues. The Federalists really were America's first political party. They were the first political party um, that gets into the White House, actually, affiliated into the White House. Um, they're created by Alexander Hamilton, who is an extreme extremist when you're talking about scope and power of the federal government, which is the number one issue why these two groups form. Um, their number one goal, they want a strong national government or a strong federal government, which is where they get their name. They thought it was the government um, that should protect the country's kind of industrialism or economic center. And that's their number one focus. And this is, becomes the big issue that splits the country in their first sort of faction that we see um, in our history. Then we have another group called the Democratic Republicans, um, created by Thomas Jefferson. Um, these are a lot of farmers and artisans who really didn't want heavy government intervention. So when we're looking, at um, this split, we can't really use the same terms like Republicans and Democrats today and their exact same issues. The issue that's splitting them really is the size and scope of the federal government. Um, this is going to be the group that sort of grows out of the anti-federalist movement during the Constitutional Convention. They want limited power on the national government. Um, they want to leave a lot of these issues and powers up to the state and local governments. So the issue is, should you have a strong central government? The Federalists say yes, the Democratic Republicans say no. Um, there are other issues that they split on, but this is the primary thing that splits them. We see two groups that represent the needs, the wants, and the desires of the people in two separate sets. Now, there are subsections of them that may be more conservative or more liberal. However, these are the prevailing two groups on the number one issue facing America during this time. The important thing to understand is, is that these parties are going to change over time. We don't have either of these parties today. The Federalist Party is the first one to go by the wayside, where it's going to disband after the War of 1812, questions of disloyalty. They're really going to lose um, a lot of pull because they're not going to have a great group they're going to seem as too elitist but in the 1820s there's only going to be one political party left the democratic republican um, it's during an era known as the era of good feelings there's a lot of political agreement and a lot of political progress but in the middle of the 1820s you only have one political party and they really start to faction and splinter off into a bunch of different groups and out of a um, an election that is deemed corrupt by an individual named andrew jackson who runs in 1820 
1924. In 1828, the Democratic Republicans will have completely split and begin to break up, and a new party called the Democratic Party is going to be formed, led by their um, kind of de facto leader, a man by the name of Andrew Jackson. Um, these people, like Jackson, are going to have a lot of appeal in the West and the South, um, but the Democratic Party is eventually going to split into Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats as the decade goes on, as we get closer and closer to the Civil War. That's going to create another political um, sort of rapture or political um, revolution that happens in the country and, and reevaluation. But there are going to be other groups that are going to form as well. So Democrats are going to form because if they feel like there's lack of representation in the South and the West, that the North is controlling, specifically the Northeast is controlling too much of politics. So there's going to be a movement westward. Then we're going to see a split between that Democratic Party due to slavery. Um, but as this Democratic Party emerges and Jackson emerges, there's going to be an anti-Jacksonian, anti-Andrew Jackson party that develops known as the Whig Party. They viewed Andrew Jackson becoming much too tyrannical, much more king-like. And so they are going to form to oppose him, but eventually people die. And if that's the whole reason that your party exists, you don't have a large reason um, to really be around. So you need to stay relevant to the people if you want to exist. The Democrats formed in order to oppose um, the power of the federal government but they took a lot of power. Some people thought that they were being too controlling, and so there's efforts to kick them out or kick them back, and that's going to be the Whig Party. Um, and the Whig Party is going to disband as well. Um, the Whig Party is going to turn into some abolitionist people against slavery or the Know Nothing Party that are anti-immigrant, anti-Roman Catholics. Um, so you have a lot of different splits and factions and during the... Um, Kind of 1840s and 1850s, there's a lot of political changes that are going to happen in this country before we get to the modern, um, more names for our political systems we see today. Eventually, um, all of these ex Whigs, know nothings, abolitionists are all going to really latch up underneath the Republican Party. Um, and, and they're mostly going to be um, focused on. Kind of slavery and the style of tyranny um, of what they saw with Andrew Jackson. Now, all of those things I listed, that's more of a historical recollection of how things changed in the 1800s, but what I really wanted you to grab is to understand that political parties will only stay relevant if their platform is relevant to the people. Um, so different examples of issues that completely change the political landscape. Um, we had our first party system with the um, Democratic Republicans and the Federalists, our second party system with the Democrats and the Whigs, and then the Civil War is going to create what we sometimes refer to as the third party system. So in a two-party system, um, we have a setup where there are two predominant political parties. Now, there are other small faction parties or so on what we would call third parties scattered throughout the country, but there are two prominent political parties at this time. The Civil War is going to dominate the political landscape everything right before, during, and in the two decades following after are going to be focused on causes of the Civil War, what's going on during the Civil War, and the effects of it, mostly race relations. You're going to have the Democrats um, are connected heavily to Southern slavery. They eventually could have granted the support for trade, immigrants, farmers, in later decades. And then you have the Republicans is really the party of Lincoln. Um, they're pro-business, pro-tariff in the future. They um, are not all anti-slavery. Some are anti-expansion of slavery, but the Southerners are going to be too deeply connected to the slavery system that any question of it or tampering of it is going to be seen as an attack. So the Civil War splits the country literally between the North and the South. There are other examples in history, though, not just the Civil War, that shape politics. A great example is the Great Depression, it completely molds modern politics as well. The Democrats are really going to emerge under FDR as um, kind of party that's being molded by social and economic protections, the government getting involved, heavily government run programs. And then you're going to see the Republicans that are really fighting against government intervention in business. And so business and economics becomes the number one issue for the rest of the night. 
hundreds primarily when you're talking about the split and the role of these parties. So you can see how much these have changed over time about what group is the conservative, what group is the liberal, what group is pro-government intervention, what group is anti-government intervention. These have flip-flops changed and moved and regional support has changed, but understand that there's all of these developments. But the two biggest things um, in the past, right, 150, 200 years that have really shaped the political landscape. If you're talking about two great examples of complete split, flip that form a new kind of voter block, if you will. You have the Civil War with the issue of slavery and the Great Depression with the issue of economics, but all of these really do change the political landscape. You must be relevant to the people if you want to stick around. So when we've looked at all of these, really just understand that it comes down to this one piece that because people change, so do political organizations. Political parties are really broad organizations as it says here, of like-minded individuals, that's what binds them together. So if the minds of the people change, the parties must change. There are so many different political parties, not just the Republicans and the Democrats. Like you see the donkey and the elephant here. There are many other third party um, candidates that run in the elections. Now, they don't get as much traction because they don't have as many voters. They don't have as much in the world of numbers. They don't have as much in the world of money for advertising. But these two parties really dominate Third parties do have a purpose in society. They test out new voting systems. They test out new policies that eventually gain traction, such as kind of this socialist democratic party, the far left of kind of like Bernie Sanders in the past um, half decade. You see in 2016 and 2020, this call for you know, um, kind of the paying and the elimination of student debt or really this um, universal health care for all, and so that they're much more what we'd call maybe a progressive Democrat, that real that faction is sort of coming in a little bit in more towards the mainstream of the Democratic Party. But you have the Libertarian Party, you have the Green Party, the Tea Party, all of these other smaller sects that have particular issues. For example, slavery splitting the country um, in the Civil War. The Progressive Party forming in the Gilded Age, the end of the 1800s, early 1900s, that there's a progressive movement that's formed to counteract massive um, government injustice, um, that this um, violation of human rights and workers' rights um, by giant big business. The Know Nothing Party, they called themselves the real Native Americans to beware of foreigners or foreign influence. So there's good things, right, like abolition of slavery, forming like the Republican Party or the Free Soilers, um, the progressive movement fighting back injustices for workers, but even um, things like this, where it's a xenophobic anti-immigrant political party, these are all formed based on ideals and groups of people. And even you see in a more modern era, you see um, kind of the new left, the new Democratic Party. Um, that you see the hippie movement form and changing the values and the civil rights movement really becoming a key piece, let's say the far left Democratic Party um, that's really starting to come into the world in the 60s and the 70s. So that's an example as well. But the big question is, so these are all the values. It tells you all these different kind of political parties throughout history, but what do they even do? How do they actually function? That's what we're going to hit at today. So um, there's a couple different functions that um, each political party really serves or should serve. Number one is candidates. Um, if you want to have actual say in government, you need politicians in office. So you need to work hard to get those people represented, get them elected, and that's the role of the political parties. These work at local level, state level, federal level, because all of these have an impact on the party. It's really hard to get good candidates. You may have somebody who's very popular, but if the whole political party doesn't support it, like we see Bernie Sanders in 2016 getting passed up by Hillary Clinton, or even kind of this year, he even though he had a lot of steam in 2020, Biden is probably going to take um, that role as the Democratic nominee. Um, it's really tough to get somebody that gets a lot of political support, gets 
something that matches their political ideologies, has the proper background, has the finances. And so it's really hard to keep going with this support and get everybody. So they're very, very picky and choosy about who they want to represent. So regardless of your political affiliation, regardless of what candidate you like, you need to have somebody that is, one, has enough resources to continue, or simply is what they would maybe call electable, that it meets the party's guidelines. It's going to get people from your party to vote for them, or even people from the other side or in the middle to flip um, and vote for this candidate to get them into office. People like what they're saying. You also have to not just get candidates out there, but sometimes they have to organize elections. A great example of this and a terrible example done is in Iowa in 2020, the Iowa caucus completely botched. People didn't know what had happened for almost two weeks and they couldn't recall the information quickly. So organization is vastly, vastly important. It takes money, time, it takes experience, it takes order. Um, and you really can't have one person just sort of organize, say, all right, everybody, you're going to show up at this time. It's getting the word out. It's getting paperwork. It's getting people to work these political polls. Um, you need to have the resources. You need to have a mass network. So this giant connectivity of people really, really helps, one, get the word out, two, get voters out, and get volunteers to actually work at these polling places. Then, right? We have all of these elections, these candidates, but you have to have ideas to support people. And we call these ideas platforms of a party. Each party has a platform and think of it as a physical platform. It's what they stand on, it's what they believe. Um, there are positions on different topics, their different policy, the economy, um, crime, education, healthcare, whatever it may be. And this is an example, it's an older one. This is from, um, the the beginning of the 20 teens around 2010 um, different platforms between the Republicans and Democrats but if you understand if you look at these and read these very quickly that there are differences between the two whether it be taxes or immigration or health care or elections or education or income taxes anything size and scope of the government um, whatever it may be these are all examples of splits and kind of how they stand on an issue what um, they are going to bring to the people and why it's so important to them. Lastly, really, it, it kind of gets this platform gets people to vote for them. And that's the most important part. You can't enact anything if you're not in office, if you don't have power. So it's this kind of subtle dance between getting what you truly believe, um, what the people believe, and then you actually got to get in office. Um, it helps make it clear what they stand for. It helps them give kind of a doctrine of what they're going to push for if they're in office. It really gives them a plan moving forward, but it's not haphazard and it's not random. Now, if they do get in office, the next purpose of the party is really to actually operate the government. That's the whole purpose why they exist to help govern. Um, they select leadership to make decisions and suggestions to other party members to create unity to get bills passed through. You are going to select legislative leaders. For example, you have um, Nancy Pelosi there on the right, Mitch McConnell on the left, McConnell the Republican, Pelosi the Democrat. Um, they can suggest appointments for these positions, but they can create people that can hopefully rally people of their party or get them into shape, keep them all in line. And really, they're going to rely on experience. Um, to keep this together and, and to help push and advocate for their causes. So it's not just enough to have numbers, but um, cohesion and uh, having the right advocates for your cause. The last major purpose that these, these parties serve is to strengthen the party as a whole and continue to allow it to grow and have longevity. It's not good enough to just exist for the time being. You need to have longevity in order to keep these acts in order. Um, they organize the government, they organize members in the government um, with their party um, members and, and party leaders, and they will endorse other candidates. For example, Barack Obama endorsed Hillary Clinton in the election of 2016, and past presidents do that all the time. Um, they try to shut down resistance to other parties, they try to keep a little bit of continuity. And really, with this connection, and if there's strength in numbers, if you can keep that together, you're going to help raise funds 
Um, so you can elect even more party members. You can get more sporting bills to help your party. So all of these things are really all in one that you need to get an office. You need organization. You need connection. Um, you need a strength, a unified party, or else you can't really get anything done. So that is all for today, folks. That's all we're going to be looking at. But if you have any questions or you need me to clarify anything, please drop a comment down in the section below and I will get back to you. Take care.